morning, everybody. My name is Laura Kreidberg. I'm a grad student at the University of Chicago, where I work mainly with Jacob Bean. And I'd like to introduce to you the transiting hot Jupiter WASP 43b. This planet is a two Jupiter mass planet um, with a short orbital period of just about 20 hours. And my group devoted a, a tremendous amount of HST time to characterizing the planet's atmosphere. We observed, among other things, six eclipses and five transits of the planet to measure very pre precise emission and transmission spectra that I'm showing on the left here. The top left panel is a whopping seven sigma detection of water absorption in the planet's emission spectrum. Mike Line did, and we also see absorption in transmission. Mike Line did a retrieval of the planet's atmospheric properties based on these data, and we were able to obtain a very precise constraint on the total water abundance in the planet's atmosphere. So we didn't just measure that there's water there, we actually measured how much of it there is. Uh, we found that it's, uh, the value is consistent with what's expected for a solar composition gas to within about an order of magnitude. And this is the first uh, such measurement that is both precise and reliable enough, we think, to make meaningful comparison with the solar system planets. So I'm showing that on the next slide. Thank you. Uh, so what I'm showing here is the well-known solar system trend of decreasing metallicity with increasing planet mass. You see that WASP-43b follows this trend beautifully. It would be wonderful to get some directly imaged planets on this plot, so if you're interested in working on that, please come talk to me. Thank you. I thank you. Oh, yeah. uh, I'm Thysia Kapitova. I'm a PhD student in the Max Planck Institute for Astronomy in Heidelberg. And uh, all of us know that situ ratio should be a very important parameter to distinguish between different formation scenarios. And Quinn Kanapaki at Collaborators in their study, they tried to measure situ ratio for the HR 8799C planet. But the point is that they assumed that the hot star had solar abundances. That's why, next slide please. Uh, we started a program trying to measure chemical abundances not only in companions but also in the primary stars and we for now we obtain about um, we obtain high resolution optical spectra for about 20 stars that host very low mass companions and we use MOOC to trying to identify carbon and oxygen abundances uh, uh, in these stars and so far, I can show you intermediate results for this, and we use different um, oxygen and carbon triplets. And actually, here, carbon is like this little thing over there. So it's not that trivial to identify the abundances, not only in exoplanets, but also in their stars. And another problem is that uh, stars that host directly image exoplanets are very young. So the spectra change with time due to hot spots and it's another problem trying to identify abundances. So if you want to know more, please come and talk to me and I'll tell you how hard to do this. Thank you. Hi, my name is uh, Abhijit Rajan and I am talking about characterization of cool atmospheres. This is a uh, work done with many people over multiple institutes. Next slide. Um, essentially, I'm showing you some work that we did uh, at Space Telescope to characterize HST as a direct imaging uh, high contrast instrument, the WIF C3 camera. Here's standard PSF subtraction, and here's uh, a clip or Loki subtraction that's been done after we've done a lot of work. And what we concluded was that WIF C3 is actually a very capable instrument for doing directly imaged planets. And as you can see, we have uh, HRA 799b detected over here in the F127M filter, which is the J-band peak. And it actually confirms rather well. It matches within one sigma to the J-band flux calibrated spectrum from the Oppenheimer uh, et al. paper. So um, we have uh, preliminary results on this. And actually, the paper is being written up right now. Next slide, please. Uh, I'm also involved in the BAM project, which is Brown Dwarf Atmosphere Monitoring, and um, this, uh, it's a multi-project um, uh, setup. We've got uh, already the first paper published where we've tried to do 69 brown dwarfs, very well uh, spaced across the entire LT and Y sequence. 
we've detected 14 variables. And uh, BAM2 is uh, currently just been submitted. We've detected two variables in that. Um, the next figure, this is actually a very interesting figure, and I wanted to try and talk through this. We're doing multi-epoch monitoring for these brown dwarfs. We want to try and understand what the atmosphere are doing in a dynamic sense. And uh, what we're seeing is that variables are variable, in which <laughs> what I mean is that the amplitude and the spectral type and these lines connect multiple epochs. And what you're seeing is that the amplitudes are never the same. And this is very interesting for future monitoring. OK, good morning. I'm uh, Benjamin Charnet. I'm doing a postdoc at the Virtual Planetary Laboratory in Seattle. And I'm currently working on the 3D modeling of GJ1214b. So uh, GJ1214b is a transiting warm super Earth. And uh, the observation, observational data indicated the flat spectrum here on the left, uh, which has been interpreted as the presence of high clouds or photochemical haze. But the formation of such high and C clouds is not well understood and requires probably a strong atmospheric circulation. So to study this, I'm using um, the generic LMDZ global climate model. So it's a 3D model which has been designed to be very versatile and uh, universal and has been applied to a wide, wide range of uh, planets and moon from early Earth to uh, giant planets. Next slide, please. And so my goal is to simulate in 3D GJ1214b uh, for different atmospheric composition from uh, hydrogen-rich to water-rich atmosphere with clouds and haze, and so to uh, analyze the formation of dynamics of clouds and haze and the condition for forming uh, high clouds. And also, to, I would like to produce a, a transmission spectra to try to reproduce the observation and the phase curves in thermal emission, uh, like I did here with different atmospheric composition. We can see that there are uh, huge differences, and uh, such curve could be used to interpret the future phase curves obtained by uh, JWST in the future, and so to determine the atmospheric composition of this planet. Thank you. Hello, my name is Paul Dalba. I'm a graduate student at Boston University. And uh, today I'm going to move away from talking about directly imaged planets and talk about transiting planets. And I'm even going to go as far as to talk about planets within our own solar system because there's so much we can learn from them still. So stick with me on this one. So I've acquired a data set from the Cassini VIMS, Visual and Infrared Mapping Spectrometer of a Solar Occultation by Saturn. You can see it right here. And these are the raw data, these red dots. Well, the red dots up there, you can see the transmission falls off from 100% down to 1 as the sun appears to set behind Saturn. And uh, Cassini has about 256 channels in between about 1 micron and 5 micron that I have these data. So the, the geometry between an occultation and a transit is remarkably similar. And you can exploit those similarities to come up with a transit transmission spectrum of Saturn as if Saturn were a transiting exoplanet. And so I've done that up here on the right. And you can see the transit depth, the RP over R star squared versus wavelength. So if you were looking at this, you would say, hey, wow, this exoplanet has a lot of methane in it, because that's what those large bands are. However, this relatively straightforward first first order model that I fit to these data aren't quite, it isn't quite correct. And one big thing I've left out is refraction. So refraction uh, in an atmosphere can have several effects. It can increase the flux you see. It can also decrease the flux you see, depending on the geometry you have. And this is certainly going to affect your interpretations of your transmission spectrum. And in this case, you can see the, the red circle here shows where my model is not fitting refraction. That's occurring deep in the atmosphere, outside of these absorption bands. And that's where refraction is having the biggest uh, toll on the data. Next slide, please. So what I plan to do, what I'm in the process of doing, is writing up some software that will model refraction correctly in the Saturn uh, data set that I have here on the bottom. And once I do that, I'm hoping I can fit the data and do uh, least squares fit uh, with the data and the model and uh, get the refraction fitted correctly. And you can pull out certain parameters of the atmosphere, like scale height or number density or absorption cross-section. Uh, and then since we know a lot of those things for Saturn, I'll do that and then do it for exoplanets. Thank you. Hi, I'm Sam Lawler from University of Victoria, and I'm going to talk about Fomalhaut, which is everyone's favorite directly imaged debris disk, unless you're a hobbit, maybe. Um, so, uh, 
So foam B, had the latest astrom astrometry shows that it's on this crazy eccentric orbit, much more eccentric than the disk, um, which pretty much rules out that it is a Jovian planet constraining the ring. Um, it could possibly still be a Jovian planet or a super Earth that's been scattered pretty recently, but that's a little uncomfortable because it has to be scattered much more recently than the age of the system. Um, it could be a large uh, asteroid with a dust cloud uh, to keep the dust around a little bit longer. Or um, my favorite, because it's the simplest, is that it's just a dust cloud created by a collision within the disk. Um, this has been uh, looked at by a few other authors, and they dismiss it because the collisional, life, the collisional time scales are so long. Next, please. Um, so in our solar system, so I wanted to do a better job of modeling this. So, so if you look at our solar system, you just step back and look at it. All you can see is, um, at the, in the large bodies, all you can see is the, the cold classical belt, even though about a quarter of the objects are on high eccentricity orbits. So I take this model, scale up the mass, whack it with a stick to make it look like the Fomalhaut disk, and um, when you run a collisional model, you actually find that there's about a collision every decade, which is what you need in order to have a good likelihood of seeing a dust cloud for a Fomalhaut B. So um, even though it uh, means, if, if this is true, even though this means that uh, Fomalhaut B is not a planet, it actually tells us a lot about the structure of Fomalhaut's disk and maybe even about other planets in the system that could be uh, shaping this disk. Thanks. Okay, hello everyone. My name is Laura Perez. I'm a Jansky Fellow at NRAO, and today I'm going to do a little experiment, and instead of telling you about my results, I'm going to read you a poem about them. <laughs> Okay, the title, of course, is Alma Observations of Large-Scale Asymmetries in Transitions Disks. Here we go, okay. We observe with Alma Sher risk two different transitional disks. These disks have large inner cavities where planets may form and live happily. And the disks we observe were quite bright, so we image them with Alma all right. <laughs> but the most peculiar thing happened. A symmetrical structure was patterned. Low contrast these patterns possess, so before this was not really addressed. Armed with Alma's high sensitivity, we found high significance statistically. Behold, here seen in purple, <laughs> the asymmetries are almost full circle. <laughs> oh, asymmetry so large in size, from what cause do you arise? Next slide. <laughs> so we made a nice fancy model. MC and C found the most probable. A ring alone was not a good fit, and we were puzzled, I must admit. But a steady state vortex prescription provided a much better description. We think those traps this may be of narrow extension radially, but smoothly they are quite wide, implying lots of turbulence inside. And don't forget about the residuals. Uh, they still trace some amount of material. In both cases, the structures remain that spirals seem to contain. And for the disk that here is shown, spiral arms were already known, but more data for sure will reveal if these spirals are actually real. Just remember that Alma is amazing and results are coming a blazing. Thank you very much. <laughs> Uh, hi, my name is Luca Matra, and with Marco and other collaborators, we've been working on the presence of gas in the debris disks, which is quite surprising. Uh, in particular, we've been looking at CO gas emission with ALMA, and we used Fomalhaut as a test case. Um, so we've been, we've been sending some line flux up per limit in the Fomalhaut ring, and but to go from, but to go from line fluxes to uh, CO gas masses, uh, we have to carefully analyze the excitation of the CO molecule, and we find that in high gas density regimes, uh, the excitation of the molecule is dominated by collisions, and we're in the LTE approximation. But if, uh, the, if there isn't enough gas density in the disk, which is probably the case in the debris disks, uh, the excitation of the molecule is dominated by radiation, and we're in non-LTE. So we can see that the masses of CO that, that, that are derived in these different uh, uh, regimes are as different as f uh, three orders of magnitude, which is uh, a lot. Uh, so we need to keep this in mind when we analyze CO line flux from ALMA data. Next slide, please. And what can we learn from CO observ observations with ALMA? We can learn where this gas comes in the debris disks, which is still a, a mystery. Uh, does it come as a primordial remnant, or is it, does it come from cometary collisions, for example? The other thing that we can look at is we can constrain the planetesimal compositions by making some assumptions. For example, in Fomalhaut, if we assume that the gas is of secondary origin, we can 
uh, the, we can constrain the COIs uh, percentage in the planet decimals to 0.9%. And we can also learn about the transition from protoplanetary debris disks, and we can see how low our formal upper limit in red is compared to previous upper limits in the pre-ALMA era. And finally, we can address the question, is there enough gas in debris disks, especially young ones, to affect the dynamics? And uh, come see me and my poster if you want to learn more. Learn more. Thanks. Hi, I'm Steph Salem, and I've been using non-redundant masking to observe transition disks at MAGAO and the LBT. So like we've heard this week, non-redundant masking takes a filled aperture and turns it into an interferometric array, giving us much better uh, knowledge of our PSF than a conventional telescope would. So then you work in the Fourier plane to calculate your observables, and you can use either model fitting or image reconstruction to understand the brightness distribution of your source. And so this has been useful in looking for close-in companions uh, and also for transition disks since for, uh, for those objects, one way of forming a gap in a disk is through dynamical interactions with young planets. Uh, so on the next slide are results from non-redundant masking observations of the transition disk Ticha, which had a planet, compa uh, planet candidate discovered in 2011. Uh, and so these are from binary fits to the archival uh, detection images and to two follow-up data sets taken one and three years after the uh, initial detection. And so you can see that we see evidence for the companion in our re-reduction of the discovery images, but in the follow-up data sets, we don't really see clear signs of a uh, planet being there. So if you want to hear more about the observations and the implications of these non-detections, you can come talk to me or look at my poster. Thanks. Uh, good morning. My name is Nick Ballering. I'm a graduate student at the University of Arizona. Um, I am starting a project to study the Beta Pictoris debris disk with Spitzer. And you can see in the center panel here is the MIPS 24 micron image of Beta Pic. And uh, this is obviously not new data, it's from the Spitzer Cold Mission, but it actually has never been fully analyzed or published. So what I'm doing is constructing a model of the disk that not only fits the mid-infrared images, but simultaneously fits the scattered light images, like you can see in the top panel from Hubble, as well as the um, longer wavelength far IR thermal images from Herschel. And simultaneously fitting all of these images, we'll be able to constrain the disk geometry, but more importantly, a lot of the grain properties, like the grain sizes and the grain compositions. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, there's also Spitzer infrared spectrograph data on the debris disk, and the way these observations were taken is that the slit of the spectrograph was aligned along the plane of the disk and then stepped up and down. So I've reconstructed a data cube along the plane of the disk in the mid-infrared spanning roughly 5 to 40 microns. And then uh, you can extract a spectrum at any point along the disk to get some spatial information about the grain properties as well. So here is an example spectra pulled out uh, from a roughly 200 AU projected distance along the disk. You can see the thermal continuum rising across the bit infrared. And we can also model some of the bumps and wiggles in that spectrum to tell us about the grain properties and how those vary across the disk as well. Thank you. Hi, my name is Li Wei Hong. I'm from UCLA. And my uh, research is about modeling the debris disk of HD 131A35. What you're looking at here is the mid infrared images taking at 11.7 micron and 18.3 micron. And my research goal is to uh, find a model that can fit both of these images and the SDD simultaneously. In my model, I consider different uh, these geometries, including like an unresolved point, a ring source, or a 2D continuous disk. For the grain properties, I consider not only the grain being the black bodies, but also consider them uh, emitting like a modified black body, or uh, they are made up with uh, specific grain compositions. Uh, next slide, please. So since the structure looks to, uh, to be extended, so we first model it with a single continuous uh, disk, uh, assuming there's only a single population of grains. So on the uh, very left, you see the first column is in 11.7 micron, second column is 18.3 micron. First row is the uh, uh, data, second, is, second row is the model, and third row is the residuals. 
From the residuals of the images and the SED, we can see that the single population grant model doesn't fit the data very well. Therefore, we are uh, driven to consider a more complicated model that is composed of two separate population of grants. So we can see from the corresponding image residuals there uh, for each wavelength, they are more smooth than the uh, single population grant. Also, a SCD feed is better. Therefore, we think that uh, two population grants can uh, describe this system a lot better than a single population model. Thank you. Hello, my name is Evan Rich. I'm a grad student at the University of Oklahoma, and this is the transitional disk DOAR28. It was observed as part of the SEEDS project with Subaru using um, uh, in the H-band in scatter light. So you can see the image there on the left. The center star has been mass. Um, and we see that uh, f this is the first time this disk has been imaged. And we see a very fairly continuous distribution of dust grains. But we don't see any spiral arms or gaps, though there definitely should be a gap as implied from the SED, which has been fit before of approximately uh, 15 AU. I took this data and created a model, a, a Monte Carlo uh, model using uh, Barbara Whitney's 3D Ho-Chunk 3D model, replicating the radial profile which we saw before, um, and again, finding a gap size, but of about only about 8 AU, which is surprisingly small for what it is. If you want more information about this, you can see my poster, number 50. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, this is another project I've been working on. It uses, uh, it's again looking at uh, seeds uh, targets, but what we're trying to find is metallicity and fundamental parameters uh, like lithium abundance to try to constrain uh, looking at what those properties say about the planets or the non-detections of planets that we found around these objects. The uh, spectra is observed with the uh, shell spectrograph on APO, the 3.5 meter, and we're using the spectroscopy made easy um, software to analyze this. So if you have any interest or questions about this project, please let me know. Thank you. Hi, my name is Jamie Lomax, and I'm a first year, finishing my first year of postdoc at the University of Oklahoma, making the switch from the massive star community to the disk community. So I've been working on modeling AB Auriga with John Wisdewski and Carol Grady. And basically what you can see is there's a lot of structure within AB Auriga. There's arms in the disks, there's regions of lower polarized intensity, um, and there's gaps. But importantly, there's also what you can see is an envelope surrounding the system. And recently what's been suggested is that there is a buildup of material in the envelope due to the infall and the rotation on um, the bipolar cavities, so like right here and right here, and that when that material is projected down onto the disk, it forms the spiral structures that we see. And so next slide, please. What I've been trying to do is model the system with the Ho-Chunk 3D code to better understand what the contribution of the disk or the envelope is so that we can better understand when and where it's affecting what we see in the disk. And so I've been doing this by trying to fit the SED of the system well. So here you can see that the um, SED points with different lines that represent some of the different models that I've um, done, while also reproducing the morphology of the disk. And so that's um, an image from one of our models. The idea is not to purposely reproduce spirals coming back out of the code, but just the visibility of the disk and make sure that we can still see the gap that's within the disk. And so, of course, you know, we're not seeing the spiral arms that you can't really see very well in this actual data. But the end result is that we don't think in the JH and K bands that the envelope is very significant to the data um, in the data, and we're not seeing it very much. And so then we could go ahead and maybe trace out how the spiral arms are moving over time. If you really want to be convinced of this, um, you should see poster 35.